Thank you for joining us today. I'm pleased to be here with Rob Travis from Cascade Energy, who will be talking about evaporator operation and defrost for industrial refrigeration systems. Rob, would you move to the next slide, please? I'd like to take a moment to thank our Seventh Wave members for making today's presentation possible. We are deeply grateful for their support of our online education. And now I'll turn it over to you, Rob. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you. For today, we're going to be talking about evaporator operation and defrost. And in particular, we're going to talk about four low-cost, no-cost evaporator action items to improve your efficiency in industrial and large commercial applications. The first one we're going to be talking about is evaporator fan cycling. The second one, defrost set points. Third, verifying room temperature set points. And number four, addressing fan motor and VFD issues. The key points of each one of these is that they should all be low-cost, no-cost opportunities that you'll be able to implement today in your own systems. To start out, I want to go back to the basics on how evaporator coils actually work. So number one, evaporators function to remove heat from the space. In particular, heat moves from hot to cold, or in the case of evaporators in refrigerated spaces, it moves from cold to colder locations. The evaporators are controlled um, through either um, temperature sensors or through thermostats. And the basic operation is that they open and close the refrigerated, uh, refrigeration solenoid valve to allow refrigeration to enter the evaporator coil when refrigeration is needed. And then the solenoid closes when no more refrigeration is needed. At the same time, the fans draw the air through the evaporator so the fans get the air going through it gets exposed to the uh, colder refrigerant and drops the temperature of the air. So in the uh, figure you see here, we can see that in the application of a freezer, we've got an average room air temperature of zero degrees down at the bottom. And in the normal course of things, we all know that heat rises. So at that zero degree temperature, the heat will rise. And around the ceiling of the room, it might be plus three degrees. It'll be a few degrees higher than the average room temperature. Now, our evaporators are located up at the ceiling, and so the evaporator fans will draw that plus three degree air in through the evaporator where it's exposed to the minus 10 degree uh, refrigerate, refrigerated liquid through the evaporator. So the fans draw the air through, it reduces the temperature of that air as the heat moves from the um, warm to the cold, and then it comes out the other side in the supply air at about minus two. From there, the cold falls and mixes with the rest of the air temperature, and so we get an average room temperature of about zero degrees. But the point I want to make here is the fact that in a zero degree freezer, we actually have a myriad of temperatures that could be ranging anywhere from maybe minus two to plus three. So the first point I want to talk about today is evaporator fan cycling and VFD control. What we want to uh, advocate is enabling fan cycling in the control system so that the fans operate the same with the liquid solenoid valves. So as refrigerant is needed, our liquid solenoid opens, the evaporator fans turn on, refrigeration is taking place. As the temperature is satisfied, the liquid solenoid then closes, the fans turn off, and refrigeration is done with. We did not want to keep the fans operating the entire time as it uses excess energy and also adds motor heat to the room. Um, as you can see in the uh, graphic here, this is a thermal image of, a, of an evaporative coil. And in a refrigerated space, we can see the temperature is all blue, but we've got those highlights there of five fan motors. So the fan motors are actually generating heat, which is a double energy penalty with operating those when they're not needed. So when refrigeration is not called for, the, um, we're using additional fan energy by keeping those fans running when not necessary. And those motors are generating heat, which incurs a uh, refrigeration energy penalty on the refrigeration system because that heat then needs to be removed from the refrigeration system. So again, the ideal is to turn off the fans with the liquid solenoid and turn the fans on when the liquid solenoid opens. So there's some issues and concerns that are uh, typically brought up with this type of opportunity. And the first question that we usually hear is, what about air temperature stratification? If we have the fans turning off, aren't we going to get a temperature differential in the room where we're going to have higher temperatures up at the top, lower temperatures down the bottom, and maybe some warm spots throughout the room? Well, 
This effect we found is nominal in most situations. You're always going to have some sort of temperature gradient, some sort of temperature difference in the room. Um, but there's also solutions. If it becomes too big of an issue, most control systems these days have a stir cycle, which will actually bump the fans on for a short amount of time, maybe two or three minutes, help stir the air, and then they'll turn back off again for 30 minutes. So in that way, you're actually able to stir the air, keep it a consistent temperature. But even then, that's only used in a, a nominal number of situations. And the important thing to remember is that heat actually rises. We all know that heat rises. And so if we turn off the fans, we are going to get some air stratification. The heat's going to rise up to where the temperature sensor is located by the evaporator. It's going to trigger the evaporator to go ahead and kick on again, and it'll start the refrigeration cycle. So it's a natural way to keep the refrigeration cycle going with keeping the fans off when they're not needed. The other thing to remember is that air temperature does not always equal product temperature. So if we're trying to maintain a zero degree product temperature in a freezer, if we have a little warm spot, it's plus two, plus three degrees temporarily, the product temperature is not going to change. It's still going to be maintained at the zero degrees. The next question we get is, what about condensation and moisture on the dock or in other areas, maybe in, in other production rooms? If we turn the fans off, are we going to get moisture and condensation on the walls and on the floor? Well, maybe yes, maybe no. It's a case-by-case -case, uh, situation. In the warmer, more humid climates, um, that's definitely a case in a lot of docks. Or in the summer months, there may be some condensation building up on the dock floor, which could create a, a safety issue with for forklift traffic. In production rooms, you might get some moisture condensation on the walls, on some of the uh, production equipment. And in those situations, it may not be opportune. We want to take a look at what, the, what that opportunity is and take advantage of it while we can. So our recommendation is, for example, in the summer months for a dock, we can turn off the fan cycling and just let the fans operate full time for the hot humid months of maybe June through August. But after the hot humid months are over, let's go ahead and re-enable the fan cycling and let those fans cycle on and off from uh, September until May. So we can realize those energy savings a good portion, eight, nine months out of the year, and only have to worry about the fans operating for those, those other few months. And what about heated rooms? There, there's certainly some situations where in refrigerated warehouses, we've got some rooms that we need, we need to heat, maybe maintain around 47 to 55 degrees, and they're surrounded by colder refrigerated rooms. Do we want to de uh, use fan cycling on those rooms? The answer is no. We want to keep those fans operating cont uh, continuously. Same concept with the heat rising, if we're generating heat up at the evaporator, we don't want all that heat to stay up the evaporator. In that case, we do want to push that heat down, so we want to keep those fans operating and make sure that we do get uh, a more consistent temperature. So that would be one exception to um, enabling fan cycling. But in the great majority of situations, fan cycling can be enabled quite easily and with great success. So the, the savings potential for evaporator fan cycling, uh, a lot of times we'll get questions about, well, aren't these only half horsepower motors, one horsepower motor? Well, let's take a look at the, uh, where the energy for a refrigerated system goes. So in the pie chart right here, we can see, should be no surprise, compressors are the number one big energy consumer. About 67% of, of the refrigeration energy goes to the compressors. But look at number two, our evaporators consume about 24% of our refrigerated energy. So there's a pretty good potential. How big of a potential is it? Well, of the total facility energy, evaporators are about 15 to 20% of your total facility energy usage. When you enable evaporator fan cycling, it is typical that you can see a reduction of fan energy by about 30%. So 30% uh, reduction of your 15 to 20% energy slice ends up being some real, um, real numbers at the end of the year. So this is a typical example um, of a refrigerated facility where fan cycling was enabled. At that facility, um, simply by flipping a switch on the control system, they are able to save 380,000 kilowatt hours per year. And what that means in terms for us is that's a 5.6 reduction in energy usage and about a savings of $25,300. So again, very real savings, very significant um, opportunity to save energy with evaporators. Uh, moving over to a defrost set points, uh, evaporator defrost is another opportunity to save energy, primarily because defrost introduces a heat load into the refrigerated room. So where does this heat come from? If you look at the pie chart here, 
When an evaporator goes into defrost, and this is specific to hot gas defrost, but you can really use the same concepts for other types of defrost, like electric defrost. But in the, the blue slice of the pie there, you can see the energy from the defrost to actually melt the frost in the coil only constitutes about 15% of the energy that's used in the defrost cycle. The big slice of the pie there, the loss to the room is 63%. So 63% of our heat energy is actually going to losses in the room, which doesn't make for a very efficient cycle. Unfortunately, that's what we're, we're, we're stuck with because we do need to have defrost on our evaporators. So the question is, how much hot gas is really needed? We only want to provide as much needed as um, to defrost the coil. Um, when we go into defrost, like the evaporator fan cycling, it incurs a double energy penalty. So not only are we losing a lot of heat to the room, as we see in this purple slice of the pie, but we also get the hot gas going back to the compressors, and it incurs a false load on the compressors. So we've got heat going to the room that we have to pay for to remove, and our compressors are ramping up because of the false load going to the compressors. So we want to be able to minimize our defrost and make sure that, number one, we are getting a thorough defrost, but then number two, making sure it's an efficient defrost. So the way we go about doing that is, number one, we want to look at the liquid runtime set points. We want to make sure our defrosts are set up to only initiate based on the amount of time it's been refrigerating, and that's going to take some testing. Number two, we want to look at the pump out set points. Uh, we want to make sure that all the liquid in the uh, evaporator is actually pumped out prior to introducing it with hot gas. If we have any residual liquid or refrigerant in the evaporator, when we introduce hot gas, that's going to extend our hot gas type uh, uh, cycle and um, incur an additional energy penalty on the system. Then we want to look at the hot gas set points. How much hot gas is really needed? Does it, do we need 15 minutes of hot gas? Do we need 20 minutes, 30 minutes? That again also needs to be tested. And lastly, seasonal set points. A lot of times we'll need additional defrost time or additional defrost frequency in the summertime and not nearly as much in the wintertime when the humidity drops. So being able to put in seasonal set points that will allow us to get a good defrost in the summer but then back off of that in the wintertime will allow us to get some seasonal savings. So a couple red flags to uh, look for here. In the control system screen you see um, this is a red flag with the 90 minutes of hot gas. Typically, if a hot gas cycle is over 20 to 30 minutes, that's a red flag that there's some other issue that needs to be addressed, and by no means 90 minutes would be needed uh, for a hot gas. The other photo we have here is for a good frost pattern. Evaporators will build frost. Having frost on an evaporator is not a bad thing. We just need to make sure that we limit how much frost is built onto the evaporator before we send it into a defrost. So a good rule of thumb is observe the, observe the evaporator and once 25 to 30 percent of the spacing between the fins is occupied by frost, that's a good initiation to start the defrost cycle. So some recommendations here. Um, defrost cycle is if you're defrosting more than twice per day, then there's probably some sort of issue that needs to be addressed. If it's something set up for four times a day, five times a day, then there's something else that may be going on that's requiring it to defrost more frequently and just a red flag to uh, start investigating. If your pump out times are less than 20 minutes, again, another red flag. Um, default would be just to change it to 20 minutes. That's a pretty safe bet. Um, but you can also test that to see what the actual defrost pump out time that needs to be for each evaporator. And if the hot gas time is over 20 minutes, again, another red flag. Uh, time to investigate why that's the case. Uh, maybe it's not getting a good defrost because the liquid solenoid valve is leaking. And there's a myriad of different reasons you can look into that might be a, just a maintenance-related issue that needs to be addressed. And then there are defrost initiation. Uh, we want to make sure that we're using liquid runtime, which is based on the actual cooling time of the evaporator, versus just a scheduled time, which may or may not um, send an evaporator into a defrost, uh, whether it needs it or not. The other two graphics here on the slide I, I don't want to present is just thermal images of evaporators going through defrost. And so this is just a good indication of how much heat is actually being generated. We've got a lot of surface area on those evaporators, a lot of fins and tube surface area. And when it goes into a defrost, you can see here that we've got a 51 degree uh, surface area in a zero degree freezer. And so if that is 51 degrees over a half an hour, 45 minutes, that is really a significant heat load in that system. Going on to point number three, uh, we just want to verify temperature set points. 
This is pretty straightforward, but it's an exercise worth going through just to make sure that our temperature set points are in line with what the corporate standards are or with your, what your customer contracts are. So we've got a chart here that shows some of the typical uh, room temperature set points that we usually see. For a general cooler, somewhere around 34 to 38 degree te temperature set point. Meat coolers, around 28 degrees. Uh, produce coolers, around 47 to 55 degrees. Uh, docks, 38 to 45 degrees, depending on the product that's being stored there and whether it's uh, being staged. Um, your main holding freezer is usually around a zero degree set point. And then ice cream freezers usually vary between, uh, uh, depending on what the customer requirements are, between minus 10 to minus 20. What we don't want to be doing is setting our temperature set points lower than what the contracted or, or corporate standard is. If our freezer requirement is zero degrees, there's no reason for us to have a minus 10 degree set point because that's going to take additional refrigeration energy to make it colder than what's necessary. A lot of times uh, that may be the case because it helps alleviate any temperature alarms, um, any problems that might occur. But um, setting up some sort of smaller safety factor like a minus 2 or minus 3 degree set point um, with a smaller dead, dead band of maybe 1 degree is a good efficient set point to make sure you never get above that 0 degree requirement. Uh, number four, the last one, we want to address fan and motor and VFD issues. Um, this is just something that you do on a regular basis when you're walking out throughout the facility and checking on the, the condition of evaporators. Just look for anomalies. In the condition we see here in the picture, we can see on this evaporator on the, over on the right-hand side, circled in red, that side's all frosted up. That, that means that there's something wrong with that and it needs to be addressed. Um, a, a good indication of a frosted up section there is maybe the fan is out and just needs to be replaced. But either which way, that's going to cause a frost problem that's going to re result in, a, in a, uh, um, an issue that's going to have to be addressed. And we just need to replace the, uh, the fan on it. Um, you can also see in this picture that there's an abnormal frost pattern on the bottom of the coil. That might be something where we've got a liquid solenoid leaking through and we're not be, we, we can't get all the liquid out while it goes into the defrost cycle. So finding these anomalies on our regular rounds um, and then addressing them and not taking the, the path of least resistance, which is just to bump up the hot gas time to try to get that uh, defrost taken care of. We want to address the, the root cause of the issue and not just put a Band-Aid on it. Or if we do put a Band-Aid on it, then come back and address it properly. For those of you that have VFDs, we want to make sure that the VFDs are operating uh, properly. Um, that's physically looking at the VFD control in your control system and making sure the VFD is controlling um, based on room temperature. Um, and, and with that, we want to make sure that the VFD fan speed is the first element of control, and then the liquid solenoid is the second element of control. So we want the temperature to be controlled by the fan speed. Once we get down to the minimum fa fan speed, then we want that liquid solenoid to be closed. Um, also go out and take a look at the, physically look at the VFDs and make sure they haven't been bypassed. Your control system may be saying one thing, but if someone's gone over and bypassed the VFD, then the, the information from the control system doesn't mean anything. And lastly, we want to make sure that the VFDs are set up efficiently. Uh, what we recommend is saying, setting a minimum speed of 40% and then a maximum speed of 90%. If we set the maximum speed at 90%, we're guaranteed to never hit that 100% speed, which is going to give us significant energy savings throughout the year while only sacrificing a very small amount of uh, refrigeration effect, which can usually be made up down the road um, in the evenings. And with that, in conclusion, uh, I just want to point out that significant energy savings can be realized by ensuring the evaporators are operating efficiently. Uh, most recommendations in this case are simple set point changes or maintenance issues. And lastly, uh, defrost set point adjustments may be improved incrementally over time and they require vigilance to ensure defrosts are complete. So we want to make sure that anything we do, particularly with defrost, that we're following through and observing the evaporator on a regular basis to make sure we don't get any evaporators that become frozen up into ice balls down the road. And with that, I thank you very much.